Let's bow for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, the, the sermon today is entitled, Committed to What? And that is the big word that we need to hear as we look at this scripture passage that Suzanne read to you, uh, may, uh, to us, may we just be, be people who find the heart of that scripture. And Lord, bless my words and my thoughts this day in the midst of it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today, I, I want to come to you more as a teacher than as a preacher. As a matter of fact, for the next two months, as I step up to uh, the, 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 the preaching station, I want to be a teacher to you. Now, one of the things that the 21st century church needs to do at this point in our history is to become more informed about what it is that we believe. Uh, over the past uh, three, four, five hundred years, we have uh, found ourselves moving through some incredible social changes. And we've given those social movements or those social changes some names. And some of these include uh, the age of the Renaissance, the age of Western expansion, the age of scientific discovery, the age of the Industrial Revolution, and the age of the technology explosion. But we have also entered into a, a, a social change that we have begin, but begun to call the information age. With that, people expect more knowledge and insight about just about everything. And that includes the church. To be able to speak intelligently about what it means to be a Christian or to speak intelligently about what it is to be a United Methodist in the midst of the Christian movement is an important thing for us to be able to do because the world expects that of us. And if that doesn't happen, if we cannot articulate intelligently who we are as the children of God, or as United Methodists, then the, the rest of the world may just pass us by as if we have nothing really to offer. And so, this, uh, this resource, this tool that we've brought on to this campus called A Disciple's Path is a good start in that process. Uh, there's this amazing story in the Old Testament about the rise and fall of a king named King Asa. Uh, when he first began his role as a young man, Asa sought to bring necessary change to the, the way kings had been ruling the nation of Judah for many, many years. And here's what the scripture says about how his, uh, his career as king of the people began. Uh, in, in the 14th chapter, we had read today by Susan uh, the 16th chapter, but in the 14th chapter it says this, Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord. Isn't that a neat way to begin your career? <laughs> to, to, to know that you're doing that which is right in the eyes of God? He removed the foreign altars and the high places. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord the God of our fathers, and to obey His laws and His commands. He removed the high places and the foreign incense altars in every town in Judah, and the kingdom was at peace under Him. He built up the fortified cities of Judah since the land was at peace. No one was at war with Him during those years, for the Lord gave Him rest. Let us build up these towns, He said to Judah, and put walls around them with towers, gates, and bars. The land is still ours because we have sought the Lord our God. We sought Him, and He has given us rest on every side. So they built and prospered. But then in the last 20 years of His reign, which was about 40 years long, in the last 20 years, he started to drift away from God. 
And that got him into a lot of trouble. Let me read again a portion of that scripture that Susan read earlier today uh, that, that lifts up this kind of trouble that he found himself in. Uh, at that time, Hananiah, the, the seer, the prophet, came to Asa, the king of Judah, and said to him, Because you relied on the king of Aram and not on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Aram has escaped from your hand. Uh, were not the, the Cushites and the Libyans a mighty army with great numbers of chariots and horsemen? And yet, when you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hands. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. You have done a foolish thing. Or as Susan's version said, you have been such a fool. And from now on, you will be at war. Asa's career and his life ends with him always relying upon other people or other things instead of him relying upon the Lord. Notice something. Asa did not become an evil man. Asa did not become a madman. And he did not rebel against God. What happened, though, was that he started to drift away from the Lord. Oh, he might have still continued in formal worship. And he probably still respected God to some degree or another. He just slowly turned his life away from having a powerful, dynamic relationship with God. In the scripture story is this great insight. The eyes of the Lord search the entire earth to strengthen the hearts of those who are fully committed to him. Asa began his career fully committed to God. But then he drifted away. He simply let other things take priority over that. So do we. Therefore, part of the work of the church is to provide tools for us to learn how to focus our attention or to establish our priorities upon the things of the faith. Jesus is the one who established the church and the goal of the church is to be sure that there are enough resources, there are enough processes uh, happening that enable us to always know that the priority in our life, number one priority, should be that of the Lord at work in us. Part of the work of the church is to help us learn how to make God and Christ the biggest priority we can be or we can have. The church is here to help you develop that priority. And two of those tools that we're talking about in this resource that we've brought onto our campus, two of those tools are prayer and the Bible. Last week, uh, Dennis Robach came in here and, and preached for me while I was at home recuperating. And he preached on some of the tools that are available to help you improve your prayer life. If you remember, uh, he lifted up the fact that, that the Lord's Prayer can be used as a great guide. Yeah. He talked about the five-finger prayer, did he? I, I believe he did. He talked about that as a way to help you uh, to remember different groups of people to pray for. He talked about the, the, the acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S. You know, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. That if we were to do those four things in each of our prayers, every time we knelt down to pray or bowed our heads at our kitchen table to pray, uh, we would be expanding the horizons of our prayer life. He talked about the breath prayer. And I want to also mention the silent meditation. What an incredible tool that is. You know, to be people who can be quiet before the Lord. Don't rush off after you're done with your prayers, but sit there silently meditating upon what you've prayed so that in the process you can hear God respond to your prayers. 
Today I want to add to that which Dennis shared, the important factor that prayer needs to be enhanced through the regular use of Bible reading. Now, many, 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 many people pray. Some of you pray on a very regular basis. Some of you pray only when you feel that a need has arisen to do that. Many people pray. Many, many more people pray than read their Bible. I'll bet you everybody in this room has a Bible or can quickly get access to a Bible. But not a whole lot of us use it on a daily basis as a tool for reading, let alone as a tool to enhance or improve our prayer life. Prayer needs to be inspired by and informed by the Scriptures. The otherwise, prayer can be can be misdirected and ineffective. Notice what the scripture says. I want you to to keep that one sentence in focus. It begins with these words, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth. That's how proactive God is. God searches for you. God seeks you out. He is that fully committed to you. What can we do to be more fully committed to Him? It seems to me that we need to have a heart for the things of God. And that includes uh, a more dynamic prayer life, a more personal prayer life, a more community prayer life, and a prayer life that is informed through the knowledge of the Scriptures. Here is something that church leaders have observed about the church for the last 40 years or so. The heart of the church is weak. Or it is failing. Or it has become disheartened. Why is that? Well, it's because it appears that the people in the church of the 21st century are not that committed to God. I've been in the ministry now for 35 years doing this pastor stuff, and I must agree that I've noticed also that we are not people with a heart or a passion for God like the church needs. So, I want to suggest that we once again become people of prayer and of Scripture. And this will help us to become more fully committed faith people walking with Jesus. Two things can happen when we seek to commit ourselves more fully. Uh, One, our uh, personal heart can be strengthened. And two, the heart of the church can be strengthened also. If the heart of the church would be strengthened, then the church would, have a more, would be more powerful again or have a greater influence within the community than it has had in the past. It would have a greater opportunity, a greater chance, a greater potential, perhaps even a stronger voice in the community in which we live. The church would once again become the voice of authority in our culture. For that to happen, we can't be half-heartedly committed. We can't be occasionally committed. And we can't be partly committed to God. We need to become fully committed to Him. I think we can take a, a great lesson from the football game that is supposed to be played a little later on this afternoon up in New Jersey. Have you heard about that game? It's kind of a big deal somewhere, you know, somewhere, maybe even here, maybe even in your own home. We can take a great lesson from that. And the lesson is this. Um, for, for teams to make it to the Super Bowl, you can sure bet that there are a lot of people on either, either one of those teams, either side of the, of, of the football field, who are fully 
committed to those two teams. The reason is because they're diehard fans of the Seahawks or of the Broncos. But for the rest of us, we'll be fans on one side or the other for only a brief period of time. Perhaps just for the day. You turn on the TV, you see the game, you choose within five minutes who's going to be your team you're going to root for. Maybe just for the day you're committed to that team. Or maybe for the weekend as all the hoopla and excitement on the news has been sparking your interest. Maybe for the last week or two. But for many of us, our commitment to that team or our passion for that team isn't going to last much beyond the next few days. Once that game is over with, our passions, our commitment will move on from one team, from that team to something else. Our short-term commitment to whatever team will change because we'll move on to other commitments. We tend to move from one commitment to another or from one passion to another because we really aren't fully committed to too much. If anything special. But that's not the way it's meant to be in our relationship with God. How committed are you to Jesus? Remember those words in the scripture from the story of King Asa. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth seeking to strengthen the heart of those who are fully committed to him. That truth is still meant to be true in our lifetime also. If you want God to bless you, and according to this scripture, that means to strengthen your heart, then commit yourself to him more fully. You know, when you join the church, you are asked to pledge your support, your energy, your strength to the church through your, your prayers through being present, through your gifts, uh, uh, your service, you know, service to God through the life of His church, and your witness beyond these doors. That's what we're asked to pledge to. And the reason we're asked to pledge to those is so that the church can help you to lead a life of priority in those and therefore become more fully committed to God. That's the main reason that the church is here. So let me ask you a question. Can you pledge yourself to that? Let's bow for a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, that is indeed an important question to ask. Is it possible for us to commit ourselves more fully to you? Of course it is. What will it take? Help us to know. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.